All right, so um, let's move on maybe to the more like mo modeling aspects of, um, of the field and some of the challenges that we have in modeling long-term tectonics. I kind of thought about four different uh, themes that have been, um, that people have been working on for uh, several years and will still keep on working on in the future. And those are here, the finite deformation, uh, the non-linearity of the problems that we're looking at, the coupling between different physics and the vast variety of scales that we need to consider. Deformation of rock, this is not infinitesimal deformation like what we might have in an elastic model or a um, seismic wave model. These are finite deformations. We have to think about large strain, which often requires that we uh, implement remeshing or particle traces uh, in the numerical models. The problems are usually very much nonlinear, par partly because of the rheology of the rocks is very complex, and many material properties are actually very imperfectly known. We have to couple different physics. Pretty much all of the examples that I described already in the previous slide have coupling with a different system, whether it's surface processes, fluids, like what Ikoko mentioned yesterday. You have always this, you cannot just stay in one branch of physics, you have to couple between several of them. And the scales we have to handle are enormous. I don't know anybody who actually is able to cover the entire variety of scales, but long-term tectonics, especially you go from sometimes a defect inside minerals at a nanometer to thousands of kilometers of plate boundaries. That's the range of scales spatially. Temporally, there's some processes that probably matter in terms of the, uh, even within the earthquake cycle, so just a few milliseconds to, of course, the millions of years it may take to develop an entire mountain belt. So the range of scales, again, not everybody, very, I don't know that anybody actually covers the entire gamut of uh, temporal and spatial scale of interest, but these are the type of scales that we have to think about. So the domain is very broad in terms of the application and therefore the way that we can handle them numerically. So for the first kind of application themes, I want to discuss um, uh, how deformation is localized. So um, one aspect of tectonics, especially on our planet the Earth, is the localization along plate boundaries. So we see here on the left a map of the global strain rates, and we have a nicely highlighted plate boundaries like Notion ridges and subduction zone, as well as some of the more continental regions in there. The formation is clearly not homogeneous. It's kind of like what John told us the first day about fluids versus um, not really being like a traditional fluid in terms of uh, the deformation of the rocks. This is totally the case in terms of what we see in uh, the lithosphere. When we go to a plate boundary, like on the right, Southern California, you can see here this field of effective viscosity. There is a lot of variety, a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the material properties that we will need to consider. And this is actually an evaluation based on observations of, um, well, it's the stress model and then observation of geology. So there's a kind of a halfway model and stress type of things. But anyway, we can see these localized deformations, heterogeneity is developing from global to regional scale. And it goes on beyond that. If we look into the field, we see on the right, for example, a shear zone, a doctor shear zone from Cap de Creus, um, showing that the deform there is a highly deformed um, part of rock that the people are looking at and very interested in, much more deformed than the surrounding regions. So again, deformation at all scales is localized onto specific uh, features. On the left, we see how um, some ideas a little bit about how the fabric of this shear zone, for example, could change the rheology of the rocks. So we have to make these models coming from maybe what goes on at this microscopic or hand sample scale, maybe, and kind of upscaling it to various levels. At this point, we don't have a great way of going through every scales yet, So, but we are making some progress towards trying to understand the development of this shear zone, and therefore, once we get that more or less right, how this can influence the rheology and the behavior of the lithosphere as a whole. So Kelly Addison, in a poster presented in this more, uh, meeting, has shown how, for example, if you have a viscoelastic um, crust and mantle uh, sequence loaded by a um, localized fault, um, how you have evolution of stress and grain size and all of those properties in the region surrounding the fault. So this model here, it's actually coming from her, um, originally it's coming from her um, seismic cycles type of models, but uh, she has been uh, working on making this um, working towards the long term instead of just the short term kind of seismic uh, hazard type of, of um, consideration. And we can see here the kind of steady state solutions that she obtains with, we have a fault which 
hands up being brittle near the surface and having a more ductile behavior at depth, not something that is imposed a priori, but that comes out of the model. And we have variations of strain rate, that's what the various uh, colors are showing here. And you can see clearly a localization a zone of higher strain rate near the fault in here. Um, what is done also is that it's not just a strain rate, but you have coupling, for example, with grain size and those type of material properties, so that we can actually start to see what would be the default the shape and the characteristics of a ductal shear zone in the vicinity of that strike slip fault that she has is including in the model there. And one interesting thing we didn't really expect, but actually makes some sense, is that we end up with different definition of the shear zone depending on how exactly we try to characterize it. So on the left panel here, we have uh, the, um, the field of strain rate. There's no more mantle in here, so that things look a little bit more simpler. But essentially, there's a region of enhanced strain rate, which is highlighted in this red um, line in here. This might be a bit small on those slides, but the poster is available, of course. Um, and this would be a, a shear zone that could be seen, for example, from geodetic techniques, because this is a region that deforms very quickly. The grain size uh, reflects the stress field really, and we can see the evolution of grain size on the middle panel and stress on the right panel. The grain size um, gets to values that are seen in this ductal shear zone in the field in the region that is highlighted by the light blue colors. So we have a structural shear zone, something you might be able to see in the field, which has actually a different geometry, a different shape than the kinematic, um, um, geodetically detectable um, shear zone. Um, the shape that we see from the grain size is not something that is geologically very realistic, it's kind of very broad, um, and it may be actually the reason why we have a difference in the field and what is presented in the model is that, well, in a lot of those places, even though the grain size would want to be at this particular um, very fine values that correspond to myelonites and this type of rock types, well, it turns out there's very little strain happening at all, so we may not have, uh, so it may be possible that the rock does not adjust, does not reach this equilibrium grain size outside of this high deformation uh, strain zone, which is seen as the yellow outline. So the field, the shear zone in the field may be kind of the intersection of the blue and yellow outline, the ones we see geodetically, maybe the red things in here. But in this model, we end up having all of the rock properties, and therefore we start to really understand what is the effect of this shear zone in the field, uh, sorry, for long term, um, for even broader, longer term and broader scale uh, tectonic modeling. I should say that, again, this this model came originally from a, a code that was designed to do seismic cycle. And this is one of the key really is the, um, the linkage between the, sh the scales, how does the seismic cycle, for example, influence the properties of, um, of the rocks in the long term. This is a question that a lot of people have been puzzling about and pondering without necessarily making a lot of progress, but I think progress is coming now. Uh, we could bring back and have actual cy uh, cycles in, in this particular uh, model, for example. We haven't done it yet, but it should be possible. And it becomes important because recent developments, I'm showing here two papers, where it's been possible to have earthquake cycles and sequences over a relatively long term, not just a single event, but repeating events over, and we start to get long, long enough time sequences of earthquake cycles that we can start to evaluate, um, or it will soon be possible to evaluate the effect of these uh, earthquake cycles on long-term mechanical properties, therefore on long-term tectonics. The case on the right is actually from a calibration exercise, a community exercise that Ericsson published earlier this year in a strike slip environment, very detailed, uh, ruptured with large and small events, but essentially a recurrence, into, but they go about, about a thousand years in here. The example of on the left by Valzelt and all, the same group that uh, Ilona van Dinter um, talk, uh, is part of, they have a long-term tectonic structures and they see here a sequence that goes over several thousands of years, 75 thousands of years. So, we can see that we can actually follow the seismic cycles of a time scale that start to look a little bit more like um, what we need for long-term tectonics. At this point, it's long-term tectonics influencing short-term cycles, but I think we are getting ready to do, do, to do it the other way around, where these long-term cycles are going to be followed up for long enough time that they can, we can see their influence on long-term tectonics and material properties. The advances that made this possible are multi-physics solvers, because we have brittle fair uh, elastic and viscous properties in these models, nonlinear behavior, pretty much, you know, nothing is linear in the lithosphere, so uh, we have 
that's an important thing. And evidently, efficient solvers and time steppings are needed. As you know, in the earthquakes um, community, you have different time scales during the events and between the events, and um, people are really got very good at handling uh, those stories nowadays. Switching gear a little bit, um, I want to talk now about another type of coupling that is important in uh, long-term tectonics, which is the coupling with surface processes. Evidently, especially in a place like the Earth, when topography exists, it will have a, it will have an influence on climate, on weathers, and that in terms will have tendency to erode, um, you know, uh, growing topography and deposit uh, materials in um, growing, you know, basins. So over the last few years, we've really seen a lot of advances into the way that uh, people are able to couple um, interior, in a way, and surface processes. This example here from Cédric Thiolo is showing uh, on the left a, a convergent regions with no surface processes, and on the right, the same thing, the same model, but with uh, surface processes of erosion and deposition being included. And you can see that clearly we have much less relief, actually a much more realistic relief in the case with um, surface processes included, and the deformation at depth stays localized on a single fold. This makes a lot of sense. When you're growing a topography like what you see on the right, there's a huge energetical cost to it. And erosion essentially is removing that growing topography and alleviate that and it, the energy cost of this topographic buildup, allowing single structures to go on for a much longer time. Um, here's a more recent example by Andres Martinez uh, in a rifting uh, environment. Uh, what we see actually the schematic on the left shows how um, remeshing uh, is kind of very much important for this type of problems. I mean, the surface uh, processes add and remove materials. And so where the interface is, is not just following the material deformations, there have to be some different rules for it. And people are getting much better at handling this. The, uh, uh, the diagrams on the left show the development of a rift in a case with no surface processes on the top and more and more of them as we go to, um, uh, towards the bottom of the figures. We can see evidently quite different looking rifts um, with two main characteristics, the redistribution of loads and uh, alleviation of uh, energetical or topography is one thing, but there's also thermal blanketing effects so that in fact the rift in presence of surface processes is uh, the, the mantle and or what's at depth gets hotter than in the case at the top without those surface processes. So very important uh, long influence of the surface processes for long-term tectonics. And what's really important also is that these models also tell you about the development of these basement, basins. Sorry. And these, of course, are where we get some, uh, we can now have a geological record predicted by this model that can be compared with uh, observations. And for example, in this case, there's um, influence of for example, uh, variation of uh, sea level change and things like this. We can have a prediction about how that is recorded in the basin deposits so that we can start to look into that in the field. So the link between those models and observations always something very strong in long-term tectonics. The third example here that John Arthur Olive um, sent me, and, and he told me that um, if you want the reference, it's in prep while I drink French wine and go on strike all the time. Okay, we well, you know what this means here. Um, pretty similar story to what I described before. Uh, what if you have a um, brittle behavior in the crust and a more ductile material at depth, so we're getting to the same type of rheological complexity that I mentioned earlier in a model that is now coupled with uh, surface processes. They've been looking into the development of secondary faulting around the master fault that we see in, in the diagram on the left, on the bottom. And um, by comparing what they see in their uh, models and what has been observed, they've been able to kind of evaluate that the best match for this particular region is uh, when you have a somewhat moderate, but, not, but certainly present uh, erosion and a relatively strong crust. So we, these models are certainly helpful in terms of un evaluating uh, both the surface and the interior uh, material properties. The advances that made this possible, mesh evolutions, remeshing, especially in what we can do at the surface, have really been key to enable this type of uh, comparison. Laurent, uh, about a minute? Uh, a minute? Yes. Uh, I think I started at... Okay, all right. Oh, did I, did I get it wrong? Oh, maybe no, I got it no, wrong. No, I have 18 minutes. So. 
Okay, so two minutes, well, it's, it's still pretty bad. Um, so <laughs> variety of surface processes were important and nonlinear de behavior depth. All right, so I have to run a little bit more quickly than I was hoping um, on deeper melt transport. Um, something that, so essentially melting is certainly a key point of um, planetary evolutions and something that happens below the lithosphere, the melt is rising. And we are starting to look into how it might be either accumulating at the base of the lithosphere or as we see actually volcanism at the surface, how the melt can make it all the way to the surface. A uh, recent development has been, made, been making this possible, um, are actually included in aspect where we now have two-phase flow uh, in, um, linked to thermodynamics and, um, and we can start to do some very nice applications to it. So I wanted to go very quickly then to a model that my student Joe School has developed. It's meant for Mars, but the physics is the same for the Earth where we have a um, melt rising and accumulating in the decompaction channel at the base of the lithosphere. And going right away here, so this is a, a self-consistent model of this, um, of this channel. And um, I, wanted, I was trying to show a movie on this. Maybe it's not working today. Okay, well, the point is that after some time, we end up having um, the development of convection cells in that channel itself. And those are actually based on uh, crystallization uh, near the top of the channel. And so it's crystallization driven buoyancy. The point here is how does it work with long-term tectonics? The spacing of these convection cells actually correspond to the spacing of volcanoes that we see in the region of Mars that he was interested in. And so there is again, a way to evaluate this deeper process to, the, to what we see at the surface. What made this possible are again, the two-phase flow coupled evolution and uh, adaptive mesh refinement, which enables multiple resolution to be present in here. I should say before you're curious about how this works on the earth, that this requires very thick decompaction channel. And that's um, not something we expect to see on the earth. We expect it was much thicker on Mars at that time. So this is not something we necessarily see here. And the final point I wanted to make was um, how this melt extraction can influence actually mantle evolution as a whole. Uh, Hugo Lorenzo has shown a variation by tuning in whether materials get erupted or being intruded in the lithosphere, we can get some very different evolution of the planet. So without getting into details about this, just to let you know that the coupling between melt migration and a long-term tectonics actually has influences for long-term planetary evolution, etc. Skim, skim, and skipping. So the last things that I wanted, the my final slide really is this assessment about kind of the future of long-term tectonics. We can see the characteristics of always interacting with other disciplines is really the identity of long-term tectonic. The strong link with observations, really the opportunities of um, evaluating and making models that are useful to a broader community than just us directly. This, these advances rely on a lot of new numerical and computational developments. What I call the tracer re revolution has changed completely what we are able to do. Remeshing is key in many problems. And now the future incoming opportunities, I think we are able to better uh, tie in models with observation Then that tie is gonna get stronger, stronger over time. Broadening the range of length and time scale is key. And I think we're getting as computing power increases towards what I'm calling now the 3D revolutions where we are looking at, um, because a lot of those models were just 2D cross sections and we're moving on to something more and more 3D is much more, much more commonplace nowadays.